So a very, very warm uh, good morning. Uh, I have hope that you've had a great cup of coffee and a great morning this uh, early uh, day. And I hope that you look forward to this really exciting topic as well as I do. Uh, welcome to Mobile Heights Tobin Moyle on the very exciting topic tech and the city, where we get some uh, insights and glimpses of the future smart city uh, presented by the members of Mobile Heights, Helsingborg, city of Helsingborg. We have Schneider Electric and Sigma Connectivity. Just some, uh, you just have the agenda up front. And as you see, can see, it's gonna be a really intense uh, one and a half hours. You will actually have the possibility to actually interact and, and uh, network as well. So please stay the whole full time. Uh, you will be able to, you know, talk to each other live if this is this is live as well, you know, but you know, you will really get to, uh, in contact with other people as well during this session. And in order to do that in the best way, please rename yourself if you haven't done that already in the right and the top of the corner in your picture view of yourself, you have three small dots where you can actually change your name and rename yourself, whatever your name is, obviously, but also with your company or organization's name. So please do that so we can see who you are and uh, really, you know, say hi if you see anyone you uh, recognize or if you want to get in contact with someone uh, participating as well. Well, uh, we'll just uh, go ahead and start the, today's program by welcoming today's host. So please, Ola Svedin, CEO at Mobile Heights. Just starting off with asking why this, uh, this topic, why is that so interesting for Mobile Heights? Well, I, I, I think we, we all ask ourselves the question, uh, do we live in the smart city already? I mean, what, what does it even mean, the smart city? Uh, how much technology is under the hood in, in, in the city today? Uh, so we thought that that was a really, uh, you know, intriguing subject to dig into. And, and I think today what, we, what we're going to see, we're going to look at it at different levels. And for us, that, that was a really... Uh, a really interesting way to go about it, to look at it from a macro level and then dig into a little bit the technology details of this. And I think that is you really pointing out because you've heard about, uh, you know, uh, about smart cities uh, for so long. So you might have thought that didn't we really ha uh, already have that or what is actually in the future? So it's going to be really interesting to listen to the speakers of today. Mm -hmm. So what else is happening? I know there's a lot of things going on at Mobile Heights. What else do you have in going on? Yes, so, so I usually take this opportunity to, to broadcast a little bit to our member community what, what we're doing uh, in, in, at, at Mobile Heights. And we do a lot of things uh, for you as, as members. Uh, but I, today I wanted to pick out one thing in, in particular that we, are, uh, that we are engaged in that we have been doing for actually for uh, uh, 12 years. Uh, and that is uh, uh, an event we call Power Hour. Uh, and, and, you know, when the pandemic started about 18 months ago, we, we asked ourselves uh, the question, how can we keep the momentum going in, in the, uh, during the pandemic? Uh, so one of the things we did, we leveled up with, uh, with this activity Power Hour and Power Hour, that, that's a, a, an, a, an event where startups uh, get the opportunity to meet a senior expert panel uh, and get advice and get access to uh, the panel's uh, extensive network. And we've been doing this, as I said, for 12 years, but in the last 18 months, we have had no less than 36 companies uh, in uh, meeting the expert panel. Uh, so I wanted to bring this up and also uh, for you uh, in the meeting today, in the seminar today, listening to this, if you are a startup or if you uh, happen to know of a startup that could benefit from meeting the expert panel, uh, let us know, give us a call, uh, drop us an email, and we'll make sure that they get uh, their, their time in, in, uh, with, with, the, with the panel. So that's what I wanted to bring up today. We do a lot of things uh, in, in Mobile Heights besides this, but I wanted to highlight Power Hour today. Yeah, and I think that's a great opportunity, Ola. And I think uh, everyone who's interested really should get in contact with you because it's a, 
a really good way to get connected and, and get help. And uh, so, uh, you, you know, holler. And I would like just to address that to everyone who's uh, uh, attending today. We have all, over 100 registered participants and, and use the chat. Uh, do not use your voice uh, because then it, it might be a very uh, loud shattering here, but use the chat if you want to comment, ask questions, get in contact with Ola or anyone at Mobile Heights uh, so they can uh, reconnect with you uh, concerning this, for example, or other exciting things that uh, are going to be brought up today. So thank you, Ola. Keep up the good work and uh, we will, uh, you will be back uh, talking a little bit in, in later on. So uh, thank you for now. You, and we will uh, go ahead and actually start presenting our first speaker, which is, uh, we're going to listen, as, as Ola already said, we're going to start with a macro level and ask Magnus Linde, product uh, manager from the city of Helsingborg to start talking about the data-driven uh, city. So the screen is yours, Magnus. Thank you for that. Let's see if I can share. Do you see the presentation? Oh, yes. Great. Uh, so the first topic for today is a project that we drive in Helsingborg City that we call the Data Driven City. Uh, but before we dig deeper into that, I want to give you some background to the project. So Helsingborg, as so many other cities and municipalities, stands before some great demographic challenges. We have a population that lives longer, are getting older and older uh, and, and we've, uh, more children are born, which means that the total percentage of the taxpayers is getting smaller and smaller. But still there is a huge demand of our services. So how do we solve this equation? Uh, we can tackle it in different ways. We can either uh, increase the tax, which is not that popular, or we can uh, lower the service level which is not that popular either, or we can do something different. We can think different, and that is what we try to do in Helsingborg. So we're challenging ourselves to, to, uh, to do new things, to try out, to dare to fail, and learn from the failing and do better next time. So, and we as a digitalization department uh, has also got the task to come up with proposal of how we can uh, accelerate digitalization in the whole city and also how we become number one municipality in a played AI. Uh, and also we need to simplify communication with our residents to shorten lead times and free up resources. So if we look at this as a total, if we analyze this, what does this mean? Uh, our conclusion is that we need to be a data-driven city. Uh, but what is the goal? with becoming data driven. We define it that uh, by use of data, uh, build a smarter, more sustainable and more caring city. Uh, but what does it mean to be data driven? How do we achieve this? If we look at the concept, we divided it in two different area. The first one we call data driven administration, which means that each administration within the uh, city need to take the responsibility to secure that they have the absolute best IT system, the tools, the work pro process to actually execute on their specific tasks. Uh, the other one we call the data-driven coordination, and that we see ourselves in the digitalization department. We cannot stop uh, the journey by just letting the administration uh, have the absolutely best tools. We need to support them with new infrastructure, new tools, new uh, expertise to, to, to help them to go to the next level. And this could be, for example, if, if they are the absolutely best on, on the execute on that task, we want to look at the, at the data generated from the system also. Maybe we can find there are some bottlenecks uh, that we could uh, take in consideration and, and make the, the, the work even better. So uh, we, we formed a, uh, a project that we call the Data Driven City. 
And we can see it as a city common platform. This is something that we uh, offer to, to the whole uh, to the whole city, all the different administrations. And we uh, cluster a lot of, of technologies uh, under the same umbrella now. Uh, a lot of, of the different technologies has run before, and uh, but not in uh, how to say a synergy uh, of the total. So. We put uh, the robotic process automat uh, automation, we have the Internet of Things, the e-services, we have our new AI lab called the Smarter City Lab, where we very quick can try out and test uh, AI use cases. We have the open data, uh, we have the total, how to say, uh, tools and expertise for, for managing uh, the, the city common data to, to, uh, to uh, to uh, take it out from, from the IT system and store it and, and make it available for different use. And we also have system integration, which means that our different systems can talk to each other and, and uh, share data in real time. So I want to give you some examples of uh, some of what we're working with. Uh, in the data-driven city. I'm not going to go through everything, we don't have the time, but I want to highlight some of it. Uh, for example, the lightning of the future in IoT. This is a project where we aim to exchange all the uh, lamp posts in, in the city, it's about 30,000. And, and when we do that, we also plan for that we can integrate uh, new hardware, new technology within the lamp poles. So, for example, we can uh, build a totally new uh, infrastructure when it comes to IoT. And also, during the journey, if there are new technologies, we can exchange it. And, and so, so we, can, we can actually have an infrastructure of IoT all over the city. Uh, we also have a cooperation with a company called Spectronic. Uh, they have a sensor technology that can measure the body temperature in the public room. So we have put four sensors at uh, Helsingborg C, uh, our central station, uh, and, and we collect the data. It's actually open data, so it's uh, free for everyone to, to look at it. And this is to see if we can see some variations in, in the body temperature in, in the public room and also what conclusions we can we can uh, take from there. Maybe it's an indication that uh, it's a flu going on or something else. So really interesting project. If we move on, uh, I'm not going to go through everything here either, but some uh, something that we work in uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, AI-driven language learning and interview training. Uh, if you are an immigrant, come to Sweden, the, more or less the only way to learn the, the, the Swedish language is by attending the course F, uh, SFI. And when you end for, for the day and you go home, there are more or less, uh, uh, how to say, the, the, there is no chance for you to, to continue practice your, uh, the Swedish language because you don't have anything, anyone to practice it with. So what we have done is uh, we have developed an uh, AI-driven uh, conversation robot uh, that you can use on a computer or a smartphone where you can continue to train the, the Swedish language. And we use the same technology so you can get interview training for a job interview. Uh, we have another uh, project which is uh, uh, we're executing together with Microsoft where we try to predict uh, where it's a, 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 free, a free parking uh, when, when you uh, drive around in the city. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the traffic there is due to that, uh, to find a, a free parking. So it's a cooperation with Microsoft. We utilize historic data and real-time data, both from uh, our, the parking apps, but also from the ticket machines. So uh, we try. We we plan to to present something uh, in the summer of twenty twenty two at our city expo. Uh, if we move on and see what is, how do we look at the future? What will be important uh, to to take the next step? Uh, the same here. We will not go through everything, but I want to highlight IT security. If we are about to work with more sensitive data, we need to, to uh, 
to focus on the IT security and it will cost it. We need to plan for it in the budget and we need also to plan for if we get hacked, how to do it and maybe train on it also so, so that we are prepared for the future. Uh, another thing is we need to challenge the law also. If we're gonna be efficient, if we're gonna be able to, to offer uh, new maybe personalized services to our citizens, uh, we need to challenge the law and, and how we can work with data all over the administrations. And the last thing here, I think that, that uh, everyone will, will uh, face is the change management. This is a journey and uh, everyone is on different pages uh, in the book. Uh, we need to educate everyone in why data is so important, why data quality is important, and what you can do with it, uh, how it can perfect your organization and, and free up resources and lower your costs. So this is pretty much what, what I was planning to present here today. So any questions? Yeah, please uh, use the chat and, and uh, ask some questions. We will have a, com a, a joint uh, Q&A with all the speakers later on. So if you don't have the, uh, the right question at this time, there will be more opportunities. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you see as uh, you have been uh, um, targeting a little bit about the main challenges, which, which would you say is, the, is actually the main one? I mean, you talked about change management, uh, security part. What, what do you see ahead? I, I think the, the law is the mm. most important that we, what we need to overcome if we're gonna uh, be able to meet the future. Yeah, both national and EU or where are we? Absolutely, absolutely. But I think we need, we need to start on, uh, on our own backyard. Uh, and then of course we, we need to cooperate with the EU and, and the rest. And, and would you say there's parts that we can do on a municipality level or, or do, we, do we always have to uh, address uh, these issues on a national level? No, I think definitely we can do it uh, on a municipality level and challenge it. I mean, a lot of the law is how, how, to, how to look at it and who, who is looking at it and, mm. and what, you can, mm. what you can suggest with it. Okay, so I have two questions coming in here. Could you tell us a little bit more about the food waste project? Yeah, it, it's a cooperation with, uh, with, with a company, uh, external company also. And, and uh, we, we measure the food uh, on, on each school uh, and preschool, uh, both before it's cooked, uh, when it's served, and, and uh, when it's, uh, how to say, thrown out. Uh, so and and based on on menu and uh, the the waste we can predict uh, how much food waste uh, we 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 will get on on a specific uh, menu uh, on a specific school. So that is a really interesting um, project yeah. also. And I think that we are up around uh, eighty percent uh, correctness in in the prediction. Yeah, it's really interesting and, and, and it's really in, in, in the right time to do that kind of project and everyone can actually do it. I mean, maybe there you don't have the challenges around the law, for example, to really find projects that are, uh, you know, low hanging, uh, maybe in, uh, in one sense. Uh, I have another question for you. Uh, it, uh, someone is uh, just uh, uh, noticing that you said if we get hacked and uh, uh, his, uh, he or she says, shouldn't it be when? we get hacked. Yes. Exactly. Uh, very true, uh, yeah. Mark. Uh, but uh, the question is, uh, what is uh, what's the citizens' thoughts on this um, uh, about around more personalized services? Uh, I mean, I mean, we, we look at it all the time. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a matter of, of budget, but I believe that if we can uh, have the possibility to work with sensitive data from different administrations, we can actually offer more personalized services that we cannot do today because it's too expensive and, and, and the target group is too small. So I definitely believe that this is, this is possible in the future. Mm. 
One last one uh, before we are uh, moving ahead. Can you tell us a little bit more about the test bed within the care sector? Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, it was a Vinova sponsored project that we um, that we executed on on last year. Uh, so so what the test bed works like this: that you can as an uh, external company or uh, academy. Uh, come up with uh, something that you want to test. Of course, there is a, how to say, we need to look at it from, from all the perspective and see if it's relevant for, for, for the care uh, sector. Uh, but then you have the possibility to actually try out your, your AI uh, use case or initiative on, on uh, actually, uh, I mean, our customers in, in the care home, uh, but also, I mean, in, in our, uh, if, if it's a, uh, how to say use case connected to the staff uh, and and that can how to say help them in their daily work so so uh, this is really interesting to see where we end up with. and I guess that there is a lot more about this that you can take uh, take part of from uh, where, where do we find more information about what you are doing within yeah. the, the city of Helsmore yeah. So if you want to find out uh, everything that we do when it comes to innovation and platform development, you can visit uh, innovation.helsingborg.se, which is our innovation database where we put uh, up everything that we do in the city for the moment. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to comment. I have a comment here in the chat from uh, Martin Gull saying we are constantly under attack. That sounded like a yeah. bit frightening. <laughs> you, you are totally right, but it feels like, oh right now uh, i think but it's good to be aware of it and, and that we constantly have to have that in mind and uh, that that hopefully we have tools to to uh, use and be prepared uh, we will move on and we will uh, probably come back to some of these questions later on uh, thank you again magnus uh, we will move on, uh, moving a little bit uh, uh, into the uh, buildings, and I would like to welcome Henrik Nilsson, VP and, uh, of the R&D Digital Buildings at uh, Schneider Electrics. So uh, the screen is yours, and the topic is Smart Buildings Enabling Smart Cities. Thank you. Let me get into the presentation. So, all right. Uh, so great to be a part of this uh, virtual event on smart cities. Uh, really thankful for that. Uh, I'd like to give you a bit of perspective uh, from an industrial player uh, and operating in buildings uh, primarily. So uh, again, I'm representing Schneider Electric and I lead R&D for buildings. So. I mean, let's start with a bit of uh, context and where we're coming from. Um, buildings is a quite conservative space and there's a lot of buildings and only a few of the buildings are actually instrumented with automation in a proper way. And the segment per se, as per se is like ranked very low in the level of digitization. This is uh, coming from McKinsey 2015 where we rank 21st out of 22 industries. So that's a starting point. Um, now there's a lot of things happening. Second thing to realize is kind of efficiencies. A lot of the building inefficiencies are actually coming already from the design phase of buildings. So that's another thing that is uh, very interesting for new construction and how do we improve the overall. And finally, we capture a lot of data already in buildings, but almost like 95.5% of the data that is being captured is not used for anything at the moment. So there is a great potential on kind of taking all this data and making useful um, value out of it. Now, the vision for the future, uh, we kind of con condense that into four main bullets. Sustainability, looking at the situation today, 40% of the world's CO2 emission is coming from buildings. We need buildings to be much more sustainable. We need to be designed and constructed with resource efficiency in mind. We need to target those net zero buildings for the future. The second part is resiliency. 
I mean, in the year 2019, we counted to like 350 man-made or natural disasters in the world. And uh, we need buildings that can be resilient to recover and bounce back to normal conditions. Whether it is a power break, if it's a cyber attack, uh, whether it's flooding or what have you, we need to have resilient buildings. Third, on hyper-efficiency, we need to automate our buildings and control the buildings with an end-to-end -end digital platform to have asset efficiency, energy efficiency, and space efficiency, et cetera. Finally, people-centric. If we look at it, like 90% of our time is spent inside buildings today. This means that we need to have buildings that are designed for buildings, for people. We need uh, to have safe buildings, healthy buildings, and, and of course, also productive environments. So this is our vision for the future on buildings. Now, looking at operating technologies where Schneider as an industrial player comes into play uh, in a small city, we look at it from three different dimensions. Uh, we have smart building environments, we have smart water environments and smart energy environments. This is where we are active. And on the smart buildings, it's all types of segments of buildings from home to data centers, offices, hotels, etc. On smart water, we're talking about water and wastewater systems, uh, parks and gardens management, etc. So a lot of industrial systems to manage these, these ecosystems. And then we talk about smart energy, of course, the energy uh, distribution and management in, in this city environment with electrical utilities, gas and uh, renewables, prosumers, environments, etc. So all these are very important kind of silos of a city. And the more we can integrate the value of these, the more we can scale, scale, scale together. So this is the play field that we come in from an, uh, from an operating technology, from an industrial player perspective into the small city. And if we zoom into a bit more the foundation and the smart buildings perspective, we can look at the left side here. When we start with kind of the, the pyramid of technology, the starting point is the legacy, legacy systems or legacy buildings. Many of them are not even yet equipped with automation systems, but many are with some older. Then on top of those buildings, we can instrument, instrument in more optimized systems and that is able to control or supervise in an efficient way. And those modern systems are also able to share data into more city-wide type of uh, environments. Uh, and finally, we would come up to more like a city-level platform for OT and IT. So this is kind of how the technology scales uh, going up in the hierarchy. And for the right side of this, we just show that this is a big playground. Uh, I mean, we have the operation technology piece, which is more like centered from the bottom a lot of hardware and sensors and actuators, controllers, et cetera, equipment for different purposes. And then the technology turns much more IT centric on the top. And that's where we find much more new players like IT players, Google and the Microsofts of the world. So this is kind of the picture of an ecosystem uh, coming together on the city level. Zooming in a bit on buildings per se, uh, so this is kind of looking at a bit about the trends and the movements inside building technology. So we look at typically from three layers and the connected smart devices. We talk about edge control and, and apps and analytics. So the trends starting from the below bottom is kind of the IoTification of buildings where we see IP connected devices wireless in all forms, uh, long range, short range, cellular technologies coming, to, coming in to connect things together, uh, secure and open protocols to allow for integrations, uh, mobile use and commissioning, mass management of devices. So pretty much a strong, strong trend towards IoT in, in, in the more conservative uh, space of operation technologies. 
the next level is moving towards uh, more, more virtualization, control and management on the edge, enabling analytics and AI to a larger extent uh, and, and allowing that to be um, integrated by many different parties. Uh, supporting a large number of technical subsystems, uh, not only kind of uh, typical buildings, but also other types of subsystems that can communicate on the edge level. So the edge is becoming an integration point into kind of smart architectures. Uh, finally, on the enterprise level, where we started to see kind of the city levels and the portfolio level of buildings and management, we see a lot of need here for integration and vendor independence, system independence, where we could plug any type of data and analytics uh, to make uh, value-based services using AI, et cetera. Also an ecosystem where it's not locked into a single vendor, it's an open platform where third parties can add values, optimizers, et cetera, using this platform. So this is kind of the technology stack that we see trending in building systems today. Um, the other thing I'd like to say, since this is a, like a technology webinar and it's short time, I'd like to hit on one topic of uh, one challenge. And this is about big data. And looking at the large commercial building today, it can have two to 500,000 data points. That's a lot of data points. How do, you, how do you understand what that is? How do you leverage that data? So digging into that problem space is that we need to structure data. And uh, here we come into a technology that we call semantic modeling. And uh, we are right now uh, working hard on this to build kind of the foundation of uh, building data where we model uh, all assets, uh, physical, logical, virtual entities in the buildings using uh, class hierarchies. We, we also capture the necessary relationships between these. And we use this to describe the time series and its context. We look at the data and this model in three main classes. Uh, we look at point, which is a kind of the, the, the carry of, of, the, of the time series, the, what we measure. We look at location, which is a spatial dimension of this point, where is it and so on. And then we have the equipment, what type of process or equipment is this point connected to? And then you combine all this together and now you start to get a knowledge graph of information. So all those 500,000 data points that you have, now you can start to make use of it. And from a building's perspective, you now will end up with um, kind of uh, model knowledge graph models where you can where you can query for all types of perspectives i want to have certain type of uh, information from that building floor to uh, that type of equipment uh, and i can start to build those smart applications on top uh, without this it would be very tedious and you cannot scale, you can do some very limited type of innovation. But with this, I think we can really start to leverage all the data that we talked about from the beginning, that 95% of the data is not used. And it's really hard to understand what it is. So this is a foundational piece for enabling AI and smart integration in the future. With that, I'd like to take a step back again to look at Canada operation and technology and how that improves the city uh, on a very high level. I mean, we are improving the efficiency of the underlying infrastructure with all these technical uh, systems. We're also improving buildings and public services like schools, hospitals, transportations. And on top of that, we are enabling new innovative services. This is creating, making the city more efficient, more resilient and more sustainable, which is kind of leading to increasing attractiveness of residents, citizens and visitors, which is kind of creating jobs in a city, which is then driving competitiveness of the city. So there is a positive uh, kind of evolution here with this smart, smart uh, technology driving a smart city. So it's really exciting journey. 
um, and I really look forward to it. And uh, I will, with that, I would close my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henrik. And again, please don't hesitate to, to uh, ask questions uh, in chat uh, now or uh, never. No, but uh, you have an opportunity later on. But now is a good uh, uh, time if you have a direct question to Henrik. And I have a question, and you you actually did mention a little bit of it already. But could you say, could you give us an example where actually Schneider have been a part of our creating smart cities? Yeah, actually, we, this is kind of a large company and so on. I mean, we, I look at numbers that we have in, like two years ago, we had 250 references of jobs that we classify as smart city. And many of them are like in the, in the, in the shape of smart districts. But uh, we have some good reference in Berlin, uh, smart districts, uh, and uh, we have in Netherlands. Uh, so there is a lot of, lot of these projects going on. Uh, and there's, it's of course not typically a full, full city always, but it's in the domain of small cities. Yeah. And I, I really want to just uh, uh, on that note, uh, as and you mentioned it uh, in the beginning about the, the climate issues. We all know that we have a, a very urgent uh, situation, and, and uh, that the building uh, part is is uh, have a, a big stake in in this. And I think this is really interesting do uh, everyone actually understand that this is a really great opportunity to to get to the bottom of this and, and actually get uh, more uh, uh, positive in, in their uh, footprint? Absolutely. I think it's, I mean, with all the data that and information we are we are retrieving on the science and the kind of the, the view on the climate changing and so on, I think the awareness of energy usage and being kind of sustainable uh, with the resources and so on. I mean, it's driving, it's a good driver for our industry. And, and I think this is definitely something that we spend a lot of time on research and how can we get better. Uh, one simple thing is about fault detection and diagnostics, meaning that this instrumentation of buildings were able to detect uh, fault conditions like that, you're heating and cooling at the same time, you're your filters are, 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 are dirty in your air handling unit that you're wasting energy. You're translating problem statements into kind of, uh, kind of impact on your environment and so on. So, I mean, there, the technology is very much uh, a key thing to help us uh, manage the challenge ahead of us. Which sounds really uh, good to hear because we need all that can help us in the right direction. We have some questions coming up here. Uh, Martin Gull uh, from Helsingborg City, uh, is there or how should the industry create a data standard? Is there one semantic mod models for all buildings? That's a good, good thing. I mean, definitely the way to scale here is to have uh, hopefully as few standards as possible. And there are a few in the building space that are like three or four standards being quite, quite uh, active right now. And they are kind of about to converge as well. The standard that we are employing quite hard right now is called the BRIC schema, which is an open source slash standard that is being developed. There is another one called Haystack, which is also similar. Uh, and then there is ASHRAE, that is also, so, so there is a bit of a, it's a new area. I mean, everyone, every player understand the importance of convergence and, uh, but it's not as mature yet, but, I see great hope for that because there is an open mindness and they see the value in the environment and scaling this type of technology as a great advantage. And how about the semantic 3D city models of city GMLI, M-I-L or city J-S-O-N? Yeah, I think there are, there are definitely many aspects of modeling uh, different perspectives. Uh, and I think the, that will not be a single model, but if we use standard technology like the RDF uh, resource description framework, then you have technology that you can link ontologies together uh, and then you can leverage this kind of cross, cross uh, information and, uh, and linking of data. Okay. So, I mean, there will not be a single ontology, but uh, using the same technology will allow us to link data. So, and, and uh, there are the domain specificity of, of these models that, uh, uh, that requires it to be multiple. 
I have time for one short, short, uh, or a short answer to this question, rather. Can you comment on matter uh, on matter and whether it will also apply for commercial buildings? Um, sorry, I did not get the question. Okay, uh, this is uh, what is written here. Can you comment on matter uh, with an, uh, yeah, and whether it will also apply for commercial buildings? I need to pass that for kind of a follow-up. Okay, so, we'll take that later on, and, and yeah. Stefan, you can maybe uh, dwell on that in the chat. Uh, what are the stakeholders you typically work with, cities or property owners? Uh, I mean, it's a uh, mix. Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, definitely a mix. So, um, okay. yeah. Yeah. And we will come back uh, to you. So uh, you guys who have more questions, don't worry, Henrik will be uh, stay around and uh, uh, we can answer more questions later on. But we need to uh, move on and actually going uh, to the third level, so to say, where it's more of a micro okay. level. And please welcome uh, Christian uh, Jonsson, business developer at Sigma Connectivity with uh, a topic, multiple connectivity solutions are key for the next generation smart cities. So the screen is yours, Christian. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. One moment. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Great. So real truth, uh, real truth. I guess we can debate about the philosophical aspect of this for hours after the presentations here, but uh, one way to- uh, uh, Chris, and, uh, may I just uh, one uh, minute, because we can't see. We see that you have started to uh, share screen, but it's kind of black. Okay. Or very black rather. Let me try and share that again. <laughs> Mm. Yep, now it works. Okay, great. So real truth. Um, one definition of real truth is fact or, um, or instantaneous reality. Uh, yet another way to depict it more from a technical standpoint would be uh, accurate and secure positional and sensory data uh, of people and things in real time. Now, this is one of the things that we're all chasing as part of the fourth industrial revolution, where um, the physical, uh, digital, and biological worlds kind of emerge, emerge into one. My screen is, ah, oh, there we go. So my name is Christian Johnson. I work as a business developer for Sigma Connectivity. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about multiple connectivity solutions um, and why they're key for the, for the future of the smart city. But before we jump into that, I just want to share a few uh, pieces of information about Sigma Connectivity and what we do. So we're a premier tech house um, developing products and solutions to help companies transform their brands through connectivity. Um, so we're very much connectivity device and sensor experts, uh, developing with hardware and software, industrializing this um, and developing products, but also uh, work on the back end cloud and uh, applications, uh, artificial intelligence, etc. We're about 700 people uh, across 12 offices in five countries. And we're part of the larger Daniel group um, with uh, which is the largest privately held consultancy group in Sweden we, with 8,000 consultants. Um, and our history kind of dates back to the 80s. Uh, our labs in Lund used to be the old Ericsson mobile labs. So we sort of have the DNA of developing complex multi-radio products that are to be produced in, in high volume. So really pushing the, the boundaries um, and develop the things that don't exist today. So IoT connectivity is complex and unique. Um, 
So going back a little bit to the sort of real truth that I was uh, talking about earlier, um, it's about collecting all this sensory data. And we, we need to use different types of radios to do this in an, in an efficient way. Um, uh, on the list here, you can see a um, number of different radio technologies. So I'm sure you recognize most of them. This is not a complete list, and we, we tend to track all the different type of radio standards and up and coming technologies on the market. But uh, each technology has its pros and cons, and you want to combine these uh, in order to, to deliver the optimal solution for each and every use case. Just to give you an example, um, I highlighted ultra wideband, which is a kind of a new cool radio technology for short distance communication, uh, great for positioning. I'm sure you've all uh, heard of the Apple AirTags. These use ultra wideband to find your keys uh, when you lost them under the sofa. But they also combine it with Bluetooth in case you drop the keys on the street, you have a Bluetooth network of every single phone and iPad in the world, um, which is, uh, I think, a good example of, of how you're combining different technologies to, to, uh, to uh, approach this challenge. Um, second example here is narrowband IoT, which is a cellular technology. Um, and this has extreme uh, range, up to 100 kilometers. We tested this uh, in, in um, basements, often used for metering, etc. cetera. Not, not so good for finding your keys, however, great for uh, sending sensory data from afar of, from devices that are communicating once or twice per day, but are, have a lifetime of, of years, uh, you know, 10, 15 years. So, it's all about combining this, but but uh, obviously there's challenges in terms of cost and the complexity of combining multiple radios in small devices. Um, and one of the things that we've done um, to uh, bridge this is we developed a reference design called Ardesco. And this is a, a cellular based reference design that we developed together with Ericsson in order to a uh, shortened time to market, um, also lower the cost of, of uh, developing uh, products. Uh, so the reference design consists of uh, a few components. One is the, the sort of PCB, the device, uh, which has uh, multiple sensors and uh, radios on board, um, a cloud backend, uh, and also a, a dashboard where we can visualize the data. Um, that's mainly for being able to run uh, proof of concepts in a matter of weeks. So instead of building something just to try, so, try out a new technology, you can actually do a proof of concept and then based on, on, uh, uh, on uh, Ardesco in this case, you have a very solid platform to then productize on and you've actually tested it with the real security protocols, et cetera, that you wanna use. Uh, from a smart city perspective, this can, this can be used in many different types of applications bins, parking spaces, facility management, kind of tying into what Henrik was talking about with the uh, uh, sort of building systems, both on the IoT and, and sort of the, the backend side where you really need that sort of secure and accurate uh, data. And we're gonna be seeing a lot of IoT devices and, and data collection um, in the years to come. So this can take different shapes and sizes just to, to show you a couple of examples. Uh, so this is an Ardesco unit here, which we will use for proof of concepts. Just to give you a size idea, it's about the size of a credit card. Um, it could also be a round puck like this is for two uh, AA batteries, for instance. Um, we've done one which is super small here that uh, could be sort of worn as a mini a tag. And these all have the, the radios on board, an narrowband caps and for cellular. Um, we put Bluetooth in there, ultra wideband, etc., which you can then adapt and focus on the application you want to develop. So same solid foundation, but then you adapt it for different use cases, different applications. Um, to give you an example, here's the uh, first public uh, uh, product that, that we built on top of Ardesco. Um, it's a company called Mobilaris, uh, who work with safety solutions in the mining and heavy industry. Um, so their vision is of this zero accidents in, in these quite hazardous uh, workplaces. So they developed what they call the companion, and this is a body-worn 
tag, uh, which utilizes some of these capabilities, uh, accelerometer and gyro that can detect man down, for instance. Multiple of these, these uh, cellular and, and Bluetooth GPS technologies for positioning. Um, so different radios to, to, um, to uh, get a, a good position of where people are in, in, the, in the workspace. Environmental sensors, again, the ultra wideband technology used for proximity sensing and in this case, anti collision between uh, people and vehicles driving around it, uh, industrial sites. And so this product was launched in Q2 and uh, was based on, on uh, Audesco. Um, so, um, uh, so this is kind of uh, where we are today. Um, this all these different uh, uh, wireless technologies uh, flowing about and um uh, obviously uh, everyone's keen to know so what's what's ahead of us where where are we heading uh with all of this so um as i mentioned before uh, we believe that cellular is is uh, a key component here um one of the reasons for that is the fact that it's the, it's the only technology that allows you to actually control the flow of communication um and this is obviously very important, uh, especially when you have an increasing number of uh, devices, what we call device density in, in small spaces, uh, both in, in buildings, cities, industrial sites, um, et cetera. So uh, everyone's been, uh, obviously talking about 5G and we've been working with 5G for the past five years, uh, something like this, um, but it's still early days. Uh, still a lot of things to, to get in place, the networks to be, be in place, but we see this is where everything's heading and, and we see 5G as being the backbone of, of the future smart city, and both with new functionality, um, uh, obviously we can't go through uh, everything here today, but things like latency uh, and throughput I think are um, uh, obvious parts of this. History has, has shown us that um, uh, and uh, that both latency and throughput is something that, that we constantly strive and, and require more of. Um, just see how we all communicate today in, in terms of uh, social media, Instagram, uh, streaming videos, um, et cetera, which was unheard heard of uh, just going back 10 years. Um, but also um, the different types of te technologies that require um, different functionality in the networks, um, autonomous driving, um, network slicing, stability, but also security um, are, are key components here in, in the future smart city. Um, so even though we, we believe that 5G is, is the, the backbone and, and a, a key part of, of the future smart city, um, uh, you still require these other wireless technologies to complement and to build up uh, that complete infrastructure um, within the smart city um, to, to make it all um, play efficiently together. So going back to what I said, it's, it's complex and we need each, each of those wireless technologies to uh, accommodate each and every use case. And you kind of have to approach that uh, separately in, in each instance. So with that, I'd uh, happy to uh, to answer any questions that you guys have, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, really interesting, and it's it's really uh, turns your head around. Could you just give one example how to use actually the five G in the smart city? You were mentioning some parts of it, but maybe mm. an, a hardcore example. Yes, uh, sure. I would. Uh, I would say device sensitivity is is. is uh, uh, Quite obvious as as the number of devices grow, but I, I think network slicing is quite interesting. And uh, network slicing is is a way of um, allocating part of this uh, public spectrum to certain uh, services. It could be utilities or emergency services to guarantee communication, independent of how many uh, Instagram posts you do. You will still guarantee that service in in a, in a secure manner. Um, both used in in smart cities, but also for industrial sites wanting sort of a private network for, for, uh, for manufacturing, for instance. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, uh, one of these, these technologies so, or functionalities that I think are interesting and we'll see more yeah. of in the yeah. future. 
And Molly is asking pretty much the same, how can an ordinary citizen benefit from this new connectivity technology? Uh, if you see it on a more of a personal level, even though if uh, emergency occur, obviously this is really important for uh, any citizen. But yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, I, I think that's, that's kind of uh, speaks for itself. And, and I think we're all more and more demanding. I mean, all these technologies are here really to interact with, with humans and support us in, in uh, and having an infrastructure that supports us in, in our sort of way of life and developing these new cities to make sure that they are efficient and sustainable. And uh, it's, it's kind of part of that. Uh, Okay, so uh, I will uh, thank you again, and, and we, you will stay, and we will invite uh, the other two speakers, Magnus and Henrik, and, and we will also ask Ulla to join us to have a little bit of a bigger Q&A, and again, please use the chat and, and uh, ask your questions or give our, us a comments on this. Really interesting, and you have the whole spectrum, as Ulla was saying, you know, from the bottom to, to, uh, to the top in how to actually uh, make this future um, smart city. Uh, so please ask questions. I have one question to you all. What would you say uh, you see as the main challenges in this? Uh, I, I, we talked a little bit, Magnus, about the, the law and, and also, of course, the civil, uh, surveillance and, and uh, uh, actually into persons, uh, people's uh, uh, private lives. But what would you say is the, the most urgent uh, challenge to, to deal with? Anyone want to start? Magnus, you can start again if you want well, to. I, yeah. I can comment on one thing that we're doing. I think uh, uh, what, what uh, we see in, in, in the work with Ericsson is a matter of accelerating the rollout of, of IoT. Um, and it's really trying to remove some of these hurdles. If it's legislation, um, like you're talking about Magnus, or if it's technical hurdles, uh, which we've done with, with Ardesco, I think it's it's... A matter of accelerating this so that we can we can push these technologies out there for for the sort of greater good, if you like. Um, I think that's that's. Yeah. Um, Do you have any comments on that, Ulla? Did you have any questions? Uh, what you have thought about this? Yes, actually, I noted down a few interesting things when I listened to our our three speakers today, uh, and 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 the reflection is that. Uh, when it comes to to what Helsingborg does, uh, uh, I, I I think they're they're a bit of a trailblazer in in this area. With uh, there are other smart uh, other cities doing this as well. But I think what what uh, Magnus highlighted today is is very interesting. That my takeaway is that we are challenging the existing structures and uh, and the law infrastructure when it comes to handling of all of all uh, all of this data. And, and I think that's the only way to do it, actually, to go out there and, and start pilot projects and, and, and start challenging uh, the, the uh, you know, the old way of doing it. So that, that was a very interesting reflection for me. And the other thing that, 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 I, that I, I thought about when I listened to Henrik talking about the smart buildings is uh, how, how does the, the coming disruption of the energy sector uh, how does that really, what, what do you see, Henrik? Uh, how does that impact Schneider Electric as, as, a, as a company and, and, and your sector? I mean, we are going from fossil to solar wind battery, basically, okay. in, uh, in the next de decades. And, and how, how do you see that, you know, moving from, from burning fossil fuel to heat up buildings? to more or, more or less going to electricity? Uh, I would say we, we, we feel ours very well positioned for that. We are, we are as you know, like uh, a company focused on electricity and distribution and management of electricity. So I think we are involved in all kinds of renewables and distribution of energy and electricity. So, I mean, we are in a hot, hot space uh, and I think we see the next year as very exciting where I mean the, the new new type of uh, regulation is going to drive uh, more and more electrification, and I mean also the world becoming more electrified. So, uh, so we don't see that as a threat at all. We see that as a great great opportunity both for us and the environment. 
um, and uh, I think we are I think we are really really excited by it and, and we're spending a lot of a lot of uh, research into making these systems better and better so. Is there any particular part that, that you see of the, of the system that uh, that you see an increased demand of? In in uh, I mean, looking at the you know the physical parts of uh, what you deliver to to your customers, I would imagine, for instance, that heat exchangers would be uh, would would be more in demand in the coming years than than today. Is that is that correct? A correct assumption? Yeah, I mean, the, with the, the many kind of kind of societal drivers. I mean, we have the pandemic with the healthy buildings, with the part particle management and clean air and all of that stuff driving. Then we have the electrification driving those values. Then we have the energy usage limitations being more efficient. So I think we, we do see a great uh, kind of increase in kind of renewables with solar and all kinds of smart uh, solutions and that you're going to turn that into a kind of a, a business that scale. Uh, and then, then of course, the whole clean air and uh, small building space, it's definitely booming. And we believe the next five years in this environment that we're in is actually going to be the hottest five years that we ever have seen in, in our business. Actually, I have, uh, Ulla, I have two, if I can, uh, three actually questions coming in from our audience. So the first one is IoT products, gadget solution is one thing, but what uh, is the maturity in organizations to integrate it into operations and maintain the solutions to actually get value out of the investments? Uh, a long question. Uh, you have it in, in the chat as well, if you want to look at it. But is anyone, you know, raising hands to say yes? Thank you, I, Christian. I can, uh, take a stab at this. Uh, I mean, if, I think every solution is expensive, uh, no matter what the price, if you can't prove the value of it. So uh, from that perspective, uh, absolutely agree. Uh, you have to, to be able to define the value of, of uh, these devices or solutions if, if you are going to go ahead and, and implement them. Um, the other part of the question reg regarding sort of, uh, operations and, and maturity of this, uh, we see the whole span uh, from very conservative industries where you kind of have to take smaller steps. You can't uh, build out that grand vision from, from day one. You have to take it in, in smaller steps. Um, uh, to uh, some other industries which are more secure, which you can uh, kind of speed up that process. Um, so I would say it depends on, on the vertical or, or the industry, um, uh, how uh, receiving they are of, of, of new technology or, or uh, accustomed to it, um, I would say. And uh, we have examples of both. I, I can also add to that. Uh coming from the building space. Um, I mean, our type of uh, systems is, is typically more conservative. They are like OT technology. They are, it's an investment that is there for 20 years. Mm. It's not moving like that. And I mean, a lot of, um, a lot of that uh, kind of uh, rigor <laughs> is there to kind of allow that long life, life cycle of the solution. Now, if you start to bring more consumer trends and consumer type of uh, devices and behavior into this, you start to put in a complexity with ownership and how long, who's owning these integrations and what is the life cycle aspects? How do we maintain this to work? So there are, with every integration, it's gonna be like, uh, need to be clear on um, the SLA on, on this type of uh, solution. Okay, I'm just going to move on because we have two more questions. What about mandatory cybersecurity regulations regarding smart buildings and smart cities? Uh, uh, I assume this is the, the person asking. I assume that the governments around the world are creating laws to prevent cyber attacks. Could anyone please ex explain more on this topic? Who wants to do that? Magnus, do you know more or who, who wants to be? I can, I can share a bit. Uh, yes, a bit from, from the industry side. I mean, there are uh, kind of uh, standards and certifications evolving. There is a standard called IEC 62443, which is about automation systems in, uh, in industrial and building environments. And this is kind of what is 
in some segments now being referred to as kind of a mandatory, but it's not uh, it's not uh, kind of uh, mandated by any government or anything like that. It's more like the customer or the the, the, the that is requiring that type of standard. So there is evolving standards that are pretty advanced and and uh, putting a lot of uh, safety measures in place. And, uh, and as you can hear, this is quite complex and you will have the opportunity in the networking session here in a little while to actually talk to each other and, and uh, hopefully one of, of the speakers as well in your group to, to dwell on, on these matters because as, as we said, it's quite short uh, amount of time in a quite complex area of, of uh, details here. So I think uh, uh, it's, it's not going to be an easy yes or no answers to these questions. I have one last. Will there be a transition to DC power in buildings in the near future? Henrik, do you want to take that as well? Yes, yes, I can comment on that. Um, so I mean, definitely there are uh, standards pushing in this direction. I think, uh, and I mean, as Schneider is being uh, trying to be be on top. I think we're definitely working on this as a solution. I think it's really the the um, the introduction of this type of uh, infrastructure in a building is kind of quite difficult because it's changing kind of everything. So I think the the technology is right for our modern uh, type of use of equipment and so on. But the whole transition and introduction of this type of infrastructure in a building is quite complex. Uh, so I mean, the, it's I mean I believe it's going in that direction, and uh, I think it was I don't know exactly how it will go about it, but it will take steps by steps. So thank you so much for day uh, today, and um, uh, thanks again to our uh, great speakers and for all of you who have uh, participated with your great views and, and question and just listening uh, to this morning sessions. H uh, have a good good day and see you soon.